Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcicki. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is truly a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space, Tamara Falco is professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies and is a core member of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the University of Kansas. Valerie Gruest, a doctoral student at Northwestern and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media will introduce Tamara in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Latina and Latino Studies Program, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Jiwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institutions history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly about how the seminar will unfold. First, Valerie will tell us more about Tamara's research and career in just a minute. Then Tamara will deliver her seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar. Valerie will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Valerie, the screen is all yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Pablo, thank you so much for having me as a moderator for this seminar. It is an absolute honor for me to introduce our guest speaker for today. Dr. Tamara Falikov holds a BA in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley, and a doctorate in communication from the University of California, San Diego. Professor Falikov's specialty is the study of Latin American film industries. A newer field of interest in her scholarship is the increased importance of global film festivals and how these platforms for exhibition and potential distribution enable Latin American filmmakers to make inroads into the global market. Through her experience teaching at national and international institutions, she has fostered academic exchange and collaboration across nations. Dr. Falikov further extended this international scholarship when she was awarded a Fulbright Specialist to Portugal in 2018 and gave workshops at the Icaro Film Festivals in Honduras in 2018 and my home country of Guatemala in 2019. Dr. Falikov is currently a professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies and a core member of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies while serving as the Associate Dean in the Arts, Humanities and Area Centers in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Kansas. She has served in multiple endeavors within the academic department, as well as vast local, state, and regional collaborations to further the field of study. She is also a member of the Society for Cinema and Media Studies, the Latin American Studies Association, the Latin American Jewish Studies Association, and the Fulbright Association. Dr. Falico is also the author of an extensive selection of books, journal articles, industry reports, film festival catalogs, magazine articles, and much more. Her most recent work includes Latin American film industries, the cinematic tango, contemporary Argentine film, cine en construcción, films in progress, how Spanish and Latin American filmmakers negotiate the construction of a globalized art house aesthetic, cine argentino y la crisis de la audiencia, Argentine cinema and the crisis of audience, amongst many others. 
Last year, she was involved in a two-part podcast on the politics of film, funding sponsored by the Berlin International Film Festival. She's the co-editor of the book series for Paul Grave, Framing Film Festivals, and is currently co-editing an open access book for the U of Amsterdam Press on film festival research methodologies with a mix of scholars and film festival practitioners. Dr. Falikov has received numerous grants, both at a national and international level over the past two decades, making a strong contribution to the field and receiving numerous awards for her research. Over the years, she has been an active member in the field through her service and scholarly experiences. We are so honored to have Dr. Falikov today to share with us her knowledge and experience. Thank you so much. And as a reminder to our audience, please submit your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We will address these questions in the Q&A portion of the seminar. And with that, Dr. Falikov, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much to Pablo Mora, uh, Valerie and Facundo, you all have been um, extremely helpful in getting me here. And as I was telling the group earlier, they are a well-oiled machine. So I'm super impressed and thrilled to be here. I'd like to share my screen now. Okay, so as you can see today, I'll be speaking on fund scouting from the South to the North, finance strategies for independent filmmakers via film festival funds, and training initiatives. So I always like to start, oh my, with a couple of quotes that help situate where I position myself within the, this debate around the politics of film funding um, at festivals for Global South filmmakers. So the first quote is from a documentary filmmaker from Brazil, Elvesio Marins Jr. He um, is talking about how actually, as much as I may be a bit critical about European film funds, that in many ways, these films, these funds are really essential. So he says, quote, they try to ignore independent filmmakers like me. The people that have the power and the money only see one kind of cinema and can only read one kind of classical and commercial film language. Hirimunio didn't even get one single real from the Brazilian National Fund. It's incredible. Without European money like the Huber Bells Fund development and post-production grants, I wouldn't have been able to make Hirimunio for sure. So I always like to say that as much as, you know, I, things could be better, these funds do matter. Um, and then another perspective is from lauded, famed, um, loved cultural critic and essayist, novelist, and writer uh, Eduardo Galeano from Uruguay, who says, quote, I don't believe in charity. I believe, believe in solidarity. Charity is so vertical. It goes from the top to the bottom. Solidarity is horizontal. It respects the other person. I have a lot to learn from other people. So before I begin talking about the importance of film funds, but some of the pitfalls as well, it's important to recognize that filmmaking is a creative but very costly endeavor. Latin American filmmakers often have a wealth of creative ideas, but they lack the funds to realize those projects. And what makes filmmaking so taxing for filmmakers throughout the global South, despite the lowered cost of digital production, is that it remains a very expensive proposition. Uh, despite the move to digital production, costs remain high, especially for post-production. And so I'd like to define post-production as the use of editing, color correction, subtitling, sound mixing. Um, generally speaking, filmmakers need expensive equipment and technology, but then after they complete a film, they have to face the obstacle of actually screening and selling the film uh, at home and then hopefully abroad. So by what channels do these films see the light of day? How will it circulate, be screened? By what distribution channels? At film festivals, in theaters, if theaters are gonna survive, um, video on demand, streaming, and what kind of accolades might it achieve, enabling the filmmaker to keep creating their oeuvre? 
So in many cases, one viable avenue for production funding, if filmmakers are fortunate to access it, is through film funds and training grants offered by international film festivals. So I'd like to just cut to the chase about what I'm trying to argue in this talk today. Uh, so basically, though these funds and forms of access represent an incredible opportunity for filmmakers from what we're now calling emerging countries, this transnational funding and these training opportunities also merit further scrutiny. Um, see here, hold on. In examining the state of mainly European film funding opportunities, I would argue that some of these programs offer a top-down rather than horizontal approach to, the, uh, to these processes, which might be viewed as paternalistic. Um, but before we go any further, I would like to discuss the function and role of the film festival as an alternative exhibition space. So I'm just asking this question rhetorically. What are some of the functions that international film festivals play for filmmakers who attend with their films? Or put another way, what are some of their functions other than project projecting films outside of the mainstream? We oftentimes see festivals occupying a space where films that cannot be shown in multiplex cinemas that show mainly Hollywood fare. Um, and that's really important, especially for countries where there really aren't movie theaters at all. But there are new ways in which film festivals are um, gaining importance. And one for certain for filmmakers is that they are spaces of prestige. Film festivals are gatekeeping mechanisms. They are helping to adjudicate and determine which films are gonna rise to the top, given that today there are so many films that are out there in the world. The other important function that we don't often think about is that film festivals, some of them also operate as marketplaces. So if you ask what's the most famous and important film festival, you would hear the answer is the Cannes Film Festival in France. But people often think it's because of the films that are screened and those red carpets, paparazzi, stars, and awards. But actually it's because of the Marché du Film. That is the most important marketplace at the Cannes, at the, at film, for film festivals. And that is very important um, and often Oftentimes there is a tension between the artistic side of the film festival and then this market side, which people complain is creeping ever so slightly every year into the uh, artistic content. And there's then that that can be problematic for some people. And then what I'm really interested in studying is how film festival can can be training venues. How can filmmakers, especially first time directors, come to festivals and really learn the trade, the craft of operating within this global film festival circuit. And of course, it's important to network parties, um, all the things that happen when you show up in person. They've actually done studies that say that 80% of award-winning films are when the directors are there in person. So it does make a difference in terms of um, gaining these accolades. So I, Valerie talked about an article that I wrote, which was called Argentine Cinema in Search of an Audience or the Crisis of Audience. This is not only an issue for Argentina. This is an issue all over Latin America. And that is because um, always already, we're talking about lower budgets compared to Hollywood. And we are oftentimes talking about cinema that is a form of cultural identity and a form of communication. So how are filmmakers gonna find those audiences? Well, first of all, if countries are so lucky, there's some state funding available, perhaps there's some private funding, but most of the time filmmakers, if they wanna make medium budget films will look abroad for funding. Um, and one way to do that, as I've said, is to engage with the film festival circuit and the platform that has different kinds of funding. There's pre-production funding like script development funds. There are production funds, which can be co-production funds. And then there are these co-production, I'm sorry, post-production competitions. And once film festival programmers and curators and jury members bestow these funds on filmmakers, then that makes it easier for them to actually sell their movie back at home and abroad. 
So these are the things they have to think about in advance if they want to have their film see the light of day. Now, the funds that I'm talking about are sadly very small. These are small funds that hopefully can stretch depending on where you're filming. Um, they may translate into larger awards. And also, if you get a fund from, say, the Berlin Film Festival or Cannes or you know, many other festivals, that oftentimes is one way that you can continue the relationship and perhaps you will be premiered at that same festival because they've invested in you already. And if, the, if it's made well, they want to they continue um, to support you. So here are some examples of film funds, residencies, and training sessions. Uh, first, you're going to see these most important funds for Global South filmmakers, the World Cinema Fund from the Berlin Film Festival, or I may say the Berlinale. Then I mentioned the Huber Bowles Fund in my first slide. That is through the Rotterdam Film Festival. And this is a, um, a very important festival in the Netherlands that oftentimes wants to highlight more experimental and cutting edge cinema. And they offer different kinds of small funds for filmmakers from Latin America and the Global South. And here, Mexican, you get the joke, that is a summer residence program that where CAN goes to the Guanajuato Film Festival in Mexico and co you know, collaborates with them. So they've tried these models where filmmakers come to Europe. And then in some cases like this one, Europe comes to Mexico. Um, and you're gonna see that here as well with the training seminars as opportunities. There's an important training um, uh, workshop called the Berlinale Talents, and that occurs during the Berlin Film Festival, where a number of filmmakers, writers, critics from all over the global south are, are uh, selected to come and do master classes. They also get to see the films and, and network. This happens as well at Locarno in Switzerland, Torino in Italy. And then talents from Berlin will come to Guadalajara, Buenos Aires, Durban, Sarajevo, for example. And the point of this is to establish stronger bonds. But as Maraika del Valk states from 2013, these are all ways for these big film festivals to build brand loyalty. They also stand something to gain. They're also looking for the next big filmmaker or new wave from a country that then they can showcase and premiere first. So they absolutely are not 100% altruistic here. So now what I'd like to do is shift gears a little bit and present to you a case study that um, I conducted quite a while ago, 2011. I still think it's relevant though. And this is the basis for my work on the globalized uh, film festival aesthetics. So I'd love to chat with you more about this um, in the Q&A. So Cine en Construcción is a post-production finishing fund, and this is shown, it's offered, or it was offered in Toulouse, France, and also San Sebastián in Spain. And when I say was, it's because in 2020, they've now changed the name from Cine en Construcción to Weep uh, Latam, Weep meaning works in progress. So they're still doing something similar, it just has a different name. So when I was there in 2011, you had eight uh, post-production -prof post, uh, professionals. So these are private sector uh, business owners, and these are some of their businesses here on the poster. And they were asked to serve as the jury in looking at six feature length films from Latin America that were selected out of 70 films that were submitted that year. And the idea was that they would do a special screening with these jury members. And then I was lucky to be allowed to attend. I had to sign a release form that said, um, I would not be writing about these films in progress until they were actually released because perhaps there would be a change in the narrative. They just wanted me to attend and observe, which I was happy to do. And this event includes the directors and producers from these Latin American countries. They come to San Sebastian or Toulouse they introduce their film in progress, and then they engage with the audience, which is a very reduced private audience, and then get feedback on their film. And so I mentioned these post-production professionals, and I make a point about this because these are not 
people from nonprofit organizations. These are people who are donating their time and labor because the industry prize is a $20,000, sorry, 20,000 euro package where these companies will finish the film uh, that win the industry award, but they actually get the distribution rights for Spain or France um, as, as a result of this. So they're definitely gonna benefit from this as well, but this does help the filmmaker and producer because now they're guaranteed another home market besides their country. So these are the six films that were uh, selected when I was there. And you see the there's maybe some commonalities in terms of the youth of this of the people who are the protagonists and I will talk about that in a little while. But what's really lovely is you have a film on my left with the young man and the woman behind him. We start there that's a film from Paraguay if we go to the middle that's a film from Mexico. This is a film from Chile and I can tell you the names if we want to talk about it later. The one below is from Brazil, the one in the middle is from Colombia, and then the one on the bottom left, my left, is from Argentina. So if you look at this um, group of films, you, if you know about film industries, you know that, for example, the Argentine industry and the Brazilian industry and the Mexican industry, these are called the Trinity. These are industries that have a lot of commercial filmmaking, and they have also quite a bit of art house films and Colombia in the middle is definitely gaining. Chile, same, they're moving up. Um, not as much production per year, but they're certainly getting support from the state to um, invest in films. The one film represented, uh, the film from Paraguay, they are definitely the underdogs here. They were the underdogs because at the time, there wasn't a film law, there were no film schools. Um, and so it was really interesting to see that this film came um, in as a contender. Um, and when I was there, I pretended, I put on this hat. It was like my post-production film professional hat. I pretended to be them to kind of figure out, okay, which film is gonna win the industry award? Which film is gonna cross borders uh, more easily? which film will appeal to multiple audiences. And so I try to use that perspective to try to guess which film won the award. And I will tell you who won in a minute. I'll keep you in suspense. Okay, so why does this finishing fund matter? I already mentioned this, that all of a sudden they have a gateway into the European market, which is probably the most important market for Latin American uh, filmmakers. Believe it or not, it's not the US. Uh, oftentimes the US is seen as a closed market because people are not so interested in watching films with subtitles as those of you who live in the US know. And they are now you know, involved with the San Sebastian or Toulouse film festivals. Perhaps their finished film will be screened as part of a sidebar or in the main competition later. And the winners in the San Sebastian case, if they are Spanish language films that win, will be able to tour uh, with the Instituto Cervantes, which has centers around the world. So these are more opportunities to get their films shown. And as I mentioned in the Spanish case, it gets distribution because those post-production houses get a percentage of the territory of distribution. They're gonna get some money back if the film does well. Okay, so I'm still not going to tell you which film won. Before we're doing that, I'm going to unpack the term global film aesthetics. Um, when we talk about films that cross borders more easily, I would like to really problematize the term. When we say global film, do we really mean the whole world? And I would argue that actually, no, we do not. Um, these are, this is a stand in for this concept of an advanced industrialized country with a developed and exportable film industry. So the conventions that we see in mainstream cinema, mainly from the United States and Europe are the ones that generally are going to go over the best in this kind of film festival circuit. And as I said earlier, if you looked at all those posters, there are certain themes that's, that, that grabbed me when I was looking at them to figure out how are they being selected? Why are these films the ones that are possibly going to be 
appealing to this European market. And as I mentioned, the youth themes, the, the role of development, these protagonists coming of age films, very character driven narratives, the use of very trendy music was um, the theme of the day. And also you didn't see any kind of neorealist gritty uh, type of, of filmmaking. The formalist qualities were very glossy. It was a continuity style of editing and that type of aesthetic. In one film from Argentina, they did utilize the star system, and this is because Benjamin Avila, who directed Infancia Clandestina, which was the Argentine contender or hidden childhood, he had help from an established mentor, Luis Puenzo, the director of the official story, which won the Academy Award in 1986, if you're familiar with his film. He helped Avila because the film had a theme around the dirty war, he was able to ask um, actors Natalia Oreiro and Nestor Alterio to act in the film, which of course was very useful because, um, you know, in trying to get to the Spanish film market, these are actors that are well-known quantities in Spain. Okay, so the other thing that I wanna talk about is this question of the global versus the local. Um, it's really interesting. One would assume that film is in and of itself a transnational medium that can cross borders. We watch them in different ways and in different countries. Um, however, I would argue that no, actually certain films are gonna do better than others. And you must understand that most of these narratives have to be in a Western form of storytelling. Um, there have to be kind of global themes, but it can't be too global because if it's too global, then it's too formulaic. Um, the narrative is very homogenous. Um, it's imitative of Hollywood. It's cliched, it's stereotypical. So those kinds of films aren't gonna do well either. However, if a film is too local, then it's unrecognizable. Um, other audiences may not resonate with it. And so when I say too local, for example, some films that are considered inexportables are comedies because uh, when you see a film that's really funny and it's specifically about a particular, let's say political situation, historical event, and it's um, kind of inferred that that's what they're joking about, may, it may not be understood outside of that context. And so that's why uh, certain films just aren't gonna do well abroad. And who is it that discovers these films? So I like to liken the role of the film programmer or curator as a, a, almost like a, a sports scout that goes to different countries to look for the best baseball player or soccer player in Latin America. They are looking for the next big thing. They are looking for the next big discovery in a certain style of filmmaking, maybe young people doing interesting, innovative, new wave kind of work. Um, and it has to have local flavor, authentic, but also recognizable. So that's part of my, uh, my thinking around this global film festival aesthetic that when I go to Guatemala or Honduras, I really want to talk to uh, the filmmakers about really thinking through what they're doing. A lot of them know this, but some of them may not. And so they have to be savvy. Okay, so here is a poster of the Paraguayan film that I alluded to earlier. Maybe some of you have seen it, Siete Cajas or Seven Boxes. I highly recommend if you can get this film. Uh, I think it's available on, screening, on streaming. Um, so Siete Cajas is a really interesting example of what I'm trying to convey. I'll just have you look at the poster for a minute. You can see that Itaú was um, an investor and also Jacreta and Itaú is a bank owned uh, by Brazilian capital. Uh, and so it is a private sector investment. And Yacreta is actually a, a dam that is a multinational uh, private entity. So in this particular instance, I told you Paraguay has no film law. They're working on that now. I think it's, it's in place now, but they couldn't go to the state. Um, at the time they didn't have film schools. I think that's changing. But these folks decided, you know what, we're gonna make our film. And when I interviewed the producer of the film, um, Estefania Ortiz, she said to me, 
listen, this is an unusual film for competition. This is a genre film. This is a thriller. This takes place in Mercado Número Cuatro. It is in Asuncion. And we have a lot of local elements in our film. We really want this film to be successful in our home market. And we're not gonna have it be spoken in Spanish because if you go to Mercado Número Cuatro, which has uh, outdoor space for people to buy their produce and different goods, people speak Yopara. And Yopara is a blend of Spanish and Guarani, two official languages of the country. And as a matter of fact, when the film screened in Paraguay, um, upper middle class people don't understand necessarily Yopara. And so they had to use Spanish subtitles. The other thing that was quite interesting about this film is that they uh, tell the story from the point of view of Victor, who is a wheelbarrow boy. And what that is are a group of people, women and men, uh, who are using wheelbarrows in the Mercado Número Cuatro to help people with their groceries as a form of transport. Um, and so even though the film is set in this very genre-like thriller a la Fast and the Furious, instead of these high-end car chases, they are using a very realistic portrait uh, or you know, image of a local landscape and they're using wheelbarrows as a mode of transportation. And I'm using Ricardo Dominguez's notion of Mayan technology, which is to say, why do we have to just always try to create visual effects and be um, you know, conforming to a dominant aesthetic you know, that Hollywood has promulgated and instead harness lo local technology and tell the point of view from their perspective, which by the way, was extremely successful in the home market. It was the most important film um, in the history of Paraguay. Um, so Mercado Número Cuatro, a bustling, bustling locale where over 2000 people of different ethnicities come together to sell all kinds of wares. Um, I could talk more about the movie. I'll just tell you that, you know, fantastically, this was the film that won the industry award. So these post-production professionals saw the value in it. They saw that it was the, a really beautiful mix of the global and the local. It was shot really beautifully. It was extremely intense, but it was told with enough local specificity that it also resonated in the home market. It also did very well in Spain and it did very well in Argentina. So that is a, a positive example of when these funds work. Um, at the same time, um, this didn't go without any, some negotiation. The Spanish producers did ask the uh, Paraguayan producer to change some things in the script. Uh, there definitely is um, a negotiation. And I argue that sometimes, especially when you're talking about former colonial powers, such as Spain um, and France and many, and yes, and the Netherlands, um, some folks are very critical of this and they're saying, okay, so why are we continuing this to replicate this dynamic? Um, is there a sense of guilt? colonial guilt. When I interviewed people at Programa Ibermedia, which is a co-production fund with Spain, Brazil, and now some European countries and Latin American countries, that was one of the reasons that was told to me that Spain had, at that time, had contributed most of the money, well, a big portion of the money in making these films. Um, film scholars charge that Southern filmmakers carry the burden of representation, that they have to create a certain kind of film that will satisfy the imaginary of the North. And if the film is not um, maybe local enough, as I was saying before, or if it didn't captivate the minds of, of these gatekeepers, that it wasn't going to, to move forward. And so there's this term that um, what came from, from Colombia called porno miseria, Carlos Mayolo and Luis Espina, uh, filmmakers, they argue that this is a, a form of misery porn, that many European countries want to see kind of a desperation in Latin American filmmaking. And if things look too bourgeois, too beautiful, they will be asked to change it to reflect that kind of stereotypical image. And I have actually um, recorded some interviews where this did in fact happen. So the other thing we can do is look at uh, 
film funds and their, their mission statements, their discourses. So in terms of the Huber Bowles Fund in the Netherlands, what they look for in funding Latin American and Global South films is the quote, artistic quality and authenticity of the film. Um, and also the extent to which this film can contribute to strengthening the local climate. Um, and, and so why does this matter? Well, we, we find that this funding actually comes from the Dutch government. It is a form of overseas development money. So it is in fact a charitable donation to help countries that are not in the OECD, they're on the DAC list, they're developing countries, and that helps foment local cultural development. Now, again, this can be very helpful on one level. However, as I would argue, these development aid discourses are potentially limiting as many wealthier countries don't have to limit or circumscribe their narratives to a certain funder's expectation. That said, Many times in advanced industrialized countries, we do in the US, for example, have to think about market, market forces and those kinds of restrictions, right? So um, Daniel Burman, who is an Argentine director, told me that his teleological progression in filmmaking was actually not to go to Hollywood. That actually for him, he felt that working in that realm would be very, a, a form of, as he called it, economic censorship. So I'm not saying that there aren't limits for advanced, industrial, uh, advanced industrialized countries, but it's just a different form of that. Okay, so in the case of the World Cinema Fund for the Berlinale, their goal is to support films from regions in which film production is threatened by political or economic instability. And these films are to be produced with a German partner. So they have to find a German producer that will help them um, make the film, produce the film, and that will help uh, opportunities for this film to be seen outside of the national context, and it will create diversity in German cinemas. Now, um, in really reading about the World Cinema Fund, again, super important to have it, but the fact of the matter is the German producer gets to hold the money. That money has to be approved upon to be used. Um, and the a uh, topic of the narrative of the film has to reflect a cultural identity of their regions and should contribute to the development of the local film industry. So any film that is maybe a little bit more commercial or a comedy may not fit the bill. So one thing that I found really interesting about this relationship between narratives of films and funding is that funding can very obviously shape the narrative. Um, if I haven't made that clear already, I just want to give you two examples of situations when um, filmmakers had a script idea, they wrote it out, they had a sense of where they wanted to make the film, but then they had to change it. So famous example of Guillermo del Toro from Mexico. He wants to make a film called El Espinazo, sorry, El Espinazo del Diablo, The Devil's Backbone. His original idea for this movie was to film it in the, con in the backdrop of the 1910 um, Mexican Revolution. So he wanted it to be shot in Mexico around that historical event, but he could not get funding from Mexico. So he goes and gets money from Spain and they say, cool, we want to support your film, but we want Spanish actors, we want it set in Spain, so please change the script. So now we have a very good film, but it is set uh, with the backdrop of the Spanish Civil War because of the funding. Um, and the same thing happened for a Uruguayan film called Tricky Life, which is about prostitutes in Barcelona. It's um, somewhat funny, kind of interesting movie, a different perspective. And it was originally going to be filmed in Italy and it was set in Italy based on a novel. So again, we're going to switch to Spain. Um, and then I've written some work about how in order to make a film palatable in a home, another country, if you're co-producing, that oftentimes they mandate that you have actors from that co-producing country. So I wrote this piece about where's the Spaniard, because you always need to have a Spanish actor in order for the film to do well in that Spanish home market. And so I came up with different tropes of Spaniards in different movies. So like 
the Spanish tourist in Cuban cinema or the Spanish anarchist in Argentine cinema. So you can see where that's going. All right, well, I'm wrapping up here. And I think where I'd like to go now with my research is I'm, I've been attending these workshops and training sessions, which um, can be very useful. And again, the networking is invaluable. But what has been concerning to me is that it's, it tends to be a bit paternalistic, a bit pedantic when you have people training from Europe and elsewhere and, and asking, you know, and inviting Global South directors to come and learn but it's very much a one-way street. It's not bi-directional. Um, you know, I invoke Galliano's work. I'm a big proponent of Paulo, Paulo Freire's work. And um, I also would like to employ feminist approaches, indigenous approaches to ways in which there can be more collaboration and more input from the directors because many of them and producers as well are quite established in their countries, but perhaps aren't known as well and so I just, it kind of pains me a little bit to see this power imbalance. And I don't think that people would be opposed to this. It's just a question of how can pedagogical um, advances infiltrate, collaborate with the space of the training um, arena for, for these film festivals. So um, I'll just conclude by saying that this is a work in progress. If people have ideas for models, if people have examples of where funding shapes the narrative, I would be what I would love to hear that. And I just want to thank you for your time. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much for such an engaging and important presentation, Dr. Falico. As a reminder to our audience, uh, please submit your questions in the Q&A function. We will be sure to go through them as much as we can. But before we get to these questions, Dr. Felikov, I am super intrigued by the concept that you introduced at the beginning of the seminar when you mentioned that film festivals function as an alternative exhibition space. And my question is, are these spaces usually seen as more artistic or aesthetic than the mainstream blockbuster cinema exhibition spaces? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, we have to look at why have film festivals appeared historically? What, what's their function? And I would argue that um, because there's a history of Hollywood having such a global reach in terms of its industry and its power, that European film festivals realize that, gosh, you know, we need to have a space of resistance. We need to uh, promote, uh, and in their case, a European film aesthetic that, again, is related to how Latin American filmmakers view films as not necessarily these huge blockbuster profit-making kinds of endeavors. Sure, films are a business. It is a form of, of commerce that intersects with art. But I would say that, yeah, we, I, when I'm critical of, of some of the things that are happening in film festivals, I really want to acknowledge that as I said before, in some cases, for example, when I interviewed directors from uh, the Dominican Republic, they said to me, you know, at this point in time, uh, things have changed since I interviewed them. Really, if we make a film, we can't screen it anywhere in our home country. We don't have art house theaters. We have to go to film festivals and screen our work. And maybe, just maybe one day, we'll have a film festival. Well, now in Santo Domingo, they do have the global, uh, Festival Global de Cine Dominicano, where lots of these films that could never be seen otherwise in the country are seen. So it's absolutely an alternative um, exhibition space. Yeah, that's incredible. Thank you so much. And we actually have a question from our audience. Um, Ricardo Velasco asks, I am a documentarian and scholar. I produced a testimonial documentary about a case of the Colombian armed conflict. My work is currently gearing towards expanded documentary in the form of digital online documentary platforms. I wonder if you could tell us about funds for developing this type of work that is audiovisual and documentary in nature, but that uses a different medium and platform. Thank you, Ricardo. First of all, congratulations. I think this topic that you're exploring in Colombia around the armed conflict is incredibly important. Um, I'm actually working with a filmmaker based in Tunja, which is a town near Bogota, who is creating a mobile cinema where she's showing work that 
like the kind that you're very interested in to audiences in towns that don't have theaters and she's she's got some traction so i think you are on to something um, as far as your question around expanded documentary um, I will say that during the pandemic, there was a huge shift, and I didn't talk about that in this space, but there was absolutely a shift to online uh, film festivals, and this was incredible, as you can imagine, as it opened access for many people from many continents and different time zones. Um, I was able to go to um, Sundance for the first time. I could never afford it, <laughs> um, you know, for example. So I think that, yes, there are funds, probably, I personally don't know of them specifically, but I don't think that it's not, uh, I think it's certainly something to look at. There is a whole uh, body of literature on documentary film festivals. I actually co-edited two volume set, I didn't co-edit, I'm two people co-edited these books on documentary film festivals for the series that I am um, an editor for. And so I, I wish I could give you an answer right away. I don't have that for you. If you email me, I will put you in touch with those editors because they're going to be able to help. I think you're, you're onto something. I think these, this is a, an expanding, no pun intended, field of inquiry and production. Um, it's just not that, uh, it's not on the tip of my tongue. So, okay, I will do that for sure. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we have another question from Jorge. Thank you for all of this fascinating, interesting that you mentioned USA market as close to Latin film. Our film Jose by Lee Chen, an all Guatemalan cast and crew, all Mexican post-production, world premiered at Venice Film Festival, first film from Central America ever presented at Venice, a social impact drama. We found that Spain is completely closed market, even as the film premiered in 50 plus countries worldwide and then 50 plus USA cities. We're making more films in LATAM, how to break into Spanish market with the next film. Oh my gosh. Well, Jorge slash George, we need to talk because I'm thrilled that you were able to get your film, which by the way, I heard about. So you got a lot of good press, congratulations. That's incredibly important. That, that remember how they restricted me from being able to talk about these works in progress. Clearly you were able to capture the hearts and minds of, of critics and writers to talk about your film. Um, and you did a really good job working with your um, producer, unless you are one yourself. Um, you know, I think it is just doing the networking and talking to, you know, Iber Media would have been a way to go if, I don't know if you tried that. I, I think, again, we could talk offline about it. I'm really actually thrilled that there are makers that are here to hear my talk because I've always tried to straddle the line between doing kind of academic theoretical work, but also very useful, practical, impactful work. Um, and that's why I go to these festivals in Latin America and really want to work with the filmmakers themselves. So again, I'm going to offer you to please email me and let's talk about some strategy. And there's some people that know more about breaking into the Spanish market than I do because they're actually doing it with their films and I am talking about it. I hope that's helpful. Great collaboration going on in the seminar, I love it. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> and Maria Celeste say, says, thank you very much for this presentation, Professor Falikov. I found your reflections around the consumption of misery very compelling. Do you see a dilemma between portraying inequalities in the global South, which potentially could lead to a commitment with real social change and a mere consumption of suffering that leaves audiences at ease as if that was enough action slash participation in social struggles? Maria Celeste, beautiful, beautiful question. I mean, you have just nailed this. How do we do this? Um, what I can tell you is that there was a debate in Brazilian circles about this concept of an aesthetics of hunger. This is Glava Rocha. This is the new, uh, Cinema Novo movement of the 60s. And then we have theorists from the 80s saying, okay, but guess what? Now we're talking about a cosmetics of hunger, right? Um, Ivana Benchis, that was her idea. I think that what you are talking about is absolutely a dilemma. How are we able to pull up people's heartstrings, engage in debate, not shield the bourgeoisie from real struggles of poverty, poverty, um, inequality? These are huge gaps in Latin American countries. 
and at the same time not consistently do this in a in a way that is heavy handed and is um, very surface level. Maybe instead of talking about maybe not blaming the victim all the time, but looking at the structural inequalities and other deeper systematic problems with why things are the way they are in the films. So I think it's a question of um, not just being really facile with the way that we portray characters, um, but rather um, really deeply engaged. And one example that I can think about, which is a really famous one, and, and this could be a debate that we have, is the Brazilian film City of God. Because if you look at this film, <laughs> Miramax picked it up. So it did well, it did break into the US market. When I went to see it, um, they really marketed it in such a way to try to bring people in without knowing it was Brazilian. They had the youth in a particular stance. They looked um, you know, like they were in the favelas, youth kind of film. Um, and yet, so, so you could have had the impression that this is a genre movie, this is a violent movie. Um, and, and maybe for those reasons, people really enjoyed it. But if you really peel back and you look at the film, first of all, it's shot in a really innovative way. The aesthetics are incredible. But I would say even on a deeper level, the director worked with, an, there were two directors for this movie. It's not just Fernando Mereyes, it was Katia Lund as well. And they worked for six months in a favela and they worked with actors who were non-actors. And they got to know the community and they got to understand, even though it was based on a novel, what, how are we going to talk about these characters? What's the language that we're going to use? So it was a much more maybe grassroots effort, for lack of a better term, which then, because you know what, you ask yourself, what does it mean to be authentic? Like even that word itself is fraught, right? But <clears throat> the fact that they actually worked with people in the communities, because a lot of times there's a critique of the film Born into Brothels that won an Academy Award, a documentary. They are the, the folks that were in that were in the films. They were um, they were spotlighted. The film won an award. There were some of the students that were born into brothels that got scholarships to study photography. But the argument is that the filmmakers helicoptered in, made their movie, helicoptered out. And so that was great for the, the directors because they did something for a minute and then they were gone and they won an Academy Award. Um, and so that's your point about being at ease. Like, no, you have to make a commitment and you have to really get to know and engage with your audience. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm going with the training is like, we need to have it be more of a grassroots relationship. And that also relates to this question of boredom I hope that's helpful. Super helpful to get this well-rounded idea of how these representations are working in the film industry. Uh, thank you so much. And then we have a question from Facundo. So Facundo. Thank you, Val. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Palikov, for this uh, very insightful presentation. Um, I was thinking um, in the tension or in relation between like um, the global and the local. Uh, and I would like to, uh, if you can expand a little more, uh, particularly thinking about in the role that uh, streaming platforms can have like in this tension um, I think that there is there is some research conducted in how like, for instance, films and but also series are like kind of located within a particular uh, country, but at the same time are like uh, portraying or like uh, streaming like more international or global content. So what uh, what role can have these platforms uh, particularly like helping uh, these filmmakers? Uh, and get the content online or at the same or, or what role in not getting uh, these filmmaking like the content uh, uh, showing up uh, online or in streaming platforms. You're right. I mean, I like that you all are taking some of these ideas and you're moving them forward into this world of streaming. And I think there's a lot of work to be done in this topic. Um, what I will tell you is that currently producers and directors are on one hand very excited that streaming platforms like Netflix are coming into their countries or communities and they want to help develop stories for the platform. Um, I actually got to attend the Cannes Film Festival online again for the first time and I heard an incredible panel of African producers and directors talking about this, this dilemma Facundo. 
because what they're arguing is that, um, you know, who, who pays the piper plays the tune. They use that quote, which I really liked to say that, yes, we're very happy that Netflix is coming in, but who's going to get to walk away with the money in the end? Who's going to get to play the tune? Who's going to, you know, quien mande, right? Who's going to get to direct this? And they were very cautious. They were saying, don't give up your intellectual property to Netflix. They will give you um, access to a, a, a global platform. However, they may reduce it down. They may do what I was saying, which is perhaps, yeah, you want that balance between the local and the global. Sometimes they go over too much on the global side. So for example, uh, the Colombian series Narcos, that is a very interesting case study that people could look at. Um, the DEA agent has a very important role in that movie. And why? Well, I would argue because of funding, it's a US point of view, right? We always wanna have that point of view so that the white American audience can identify. Is that really giving a voice to the real people that were there? Mm. I would question that a little bit. So I think if there's some way that producers can have more autonomy as they work with Netflix, maybe they make their own project and they finish it and then they say, hey, Netflix, will you buy this? Then there's more artistic integrity. Um, they're gonna pick and choose ultimately, right? They're gonna be the gatekeeper. But as much as, as I heard these producers complain, they are concerned that even though Netflix is opening up an office in Mexico City, which you know, for all intents and purposes is fantastic because the fact of the matter is there are many more opportunities for TV and streaming content than there is for film, that's for sure. My film students, they're working in TV, okay? Not so much film. At the same time though, they don't necessarily think they're gonna have the same independence um, as I was talking about with regard to those film funds the same as, you know, they're going to be restricted. Thank you, Facundo. Great questions. Thank you so much. And we have two more minutes left, but we're going to try to answer the last question of the day. Um, Delilah says, thanks for this amazing lecture. I was wondering if this model in which funding shapes narratives, is it a sort of replica of the mechanisms in which some European nations state funds work? For instance, studies have shown that in Italy, the Ministry of Culture tends to fund certain plots and narratives, dramatic films, realists with certain actors, et cetera, instead of others, creating a sort of vicious circle. Did you find any other examples of this kind? Is it maybe something that has to do with how public intervention in the cinema industry is shaped in Europe more broadly? Wow, beautiful. Um, I think that's an excellent question. And I would say that um, it's a tricky one. It's a very tricky one because when you start to get into looking at state priorities for funding, you can't uh, do what, which is what I try to do. You can't ask people directly. You could, you could talk to state functionaries and ask them, what are the kinds of films that you generally fund? Because in the case of Argentina, that's very sensitive about censorship because of the history of a totalitarian governments, they will say, no, 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 we don't have censorship. We fund everything. But what would be very interesting is to look at which films were funded by the state and which funds were rejected, which, which films were rejected. So one very interesting example I, I can put forth is, and I'm going to use Argentina because what I did is I studied in the books Cinematic Tango, three government administrations and how each government administration shaped cinema for its own interests. Okay, so what was happening during the 80s with Alfonsin, they're trying to show the world we're safe for democracy now, we're gonna talk about the horrible past, you know, within certain constraints. Then Menem, oh no, blockbuster movies, let's do this conglomerate, you know, work with conglomerates, let's gut our laws <laughs> to be more neoliberal and so forth. Um, but I will say that there is a beautiful documentary called Los Rubios by Albert Albertina Carri. Oh, oh, we're ending. I'll be very brief. She shows a letter from the Inca, the film institute that says, we're not funding you for the various reasons, you know, because you're maligning the history of the 
the heroes of the dictatorship, which were her parents. And she's criticizing the fact that, yes, they were, you know, there are all these hagiographies of these, you know, amazing people that tried to overturn the government, but her parents neglected her or they did X and Y and Z or whatever. So I think that would be something you should look at as a way to really examine these politics. And I thank you. I know we're out of time. Thank you, Tamara. This was absolutely fabulous and a lot of engagement from the audience. So I learned a lot, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm new to the world of film festivals, so I personally learned a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie, for always great moderation and introduction. Thank you to our audience for staying with us uh, to the end. I hope everybody has a great rest of your day and week and invite everybody to join us next Thursday, the uh, next seminar of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Goodbye.